So let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to Luke chapter 19. Uh, Luke chapter 19. Uh, I'm mindful also of the families who are going to Northern Ireland on Tuesday. And so the Brands and the Myers will be heading off to Pastures Green. So pray for safety for them. Uh, my sister will be, and brother and I will be looking after them a little bit when they're there. And the brother Wade's going to be driving on the wrong side of the road. So that's going to be uh, interesting to be well prayed up by the time we get home again. Um, we're sorry they're, David's coming this way, they're going that way, so we're, we're sorry that happens like that. That's usually the way that I plan things. Talk to my wife, she'll tell you all about that. Um, but anyway, we're, we're, we're excited for them and their trip. Now, <clears throat> I've preached this message before. I try not to preach messages too often, maybe, um, maybe four, five, six years apart. Um, this one I preached last July, but I felt the need to, pray, uh, to preach, preach it again. Of course, when you're going on holiday, you, you know, I'm not sitting in the office and in the study all week, so you're usually going to uh, preach a song that you preached before. Is this on? So you're waving at me? Okay. Um, and so this is one uh, that I've entitled, Open Your Hanky. We'll, we'll explain that in just a moment. But let's turn, please, to Luke chapter 19. And if you're able, uh, in Luke chapter 19, we're going to read from verse 11 through verse 26. And please stand with me, if you can, for the reading of God's Word this morning. The Gospel of Luke chapter 19 and verse number 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. And sent the message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, by the way, Jesus is coming back again. He is returning. When he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called on to him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thy good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thy authority over ten cities. By the way, heaven doesn't have ten cities. Uh, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back to stay it's to this earth, and he will establish his kingdom on the earth. Verse 18, and the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be, be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept, laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou lest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thy wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money unto the bank, that, he, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury or interest? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said, Lord, he hath ten pounds. And, and I say unto you, for I say unto you, that unto every one that hath shall be given. And to him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Our Father, we pray that you'll bless the teaching and the preaching of your word this morning. And Lord, may you help us to make a difference with the things that you've given to us, our time, our, our talents, our treasure. Lord, may we leave this world having made a dent. Help us, Lord, to make a difference. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, if you will. Jesus spake this parable to those who thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And of course, the kingdom of God did not immediately come because they were not ready for it. And they rejected the king, and therefore they rejected the kingdom. And I say again, we're not in the kingdom. Jesus goes away and he receives that kingdom. And when he receives the kingdom, then he will come again and he will establish that kingdom. We pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason we pray that is because they're not here yet. Jesus will bring that kingdom. And when he comes, um, he will reward his servants who have been commanded, in verse 13, to occupy till I come. So there's certain things that God wants us to do until Jesus comes back again. The word occupy means to do business, really to invest, 
God has given us certain things here. These ten servants received one pound each. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, that's, that was our currency in, in Northern Ireland, was the British pound. And um, right now it's $1.31 per pound. You probably know that, uh, the exchange rate. But at any rate, they, they were given all the same thing. They were given um, a certain amount of money. And the Lord says, now take this money and do something with it while I'm away. Occupy till I come. Invest. Use what I've given you to make a difference so that when I come again, um, I will receive uh, what, uh, what you have done and you will be rewarded for that. Well, of course, the story goes that uh, he came to the first servant and he had taken that one pound and he gained ten pounds with it. A tenfold result. That's wonderful. Uh, then he comes to the second. He doesn't go through all ten, but he uses three here as examples. And he comes to the second one, and he had gained five pounds. You know, we're not all going to be able to be as effective as, as um, uh, all together. We're all different, you know. And we've all different in another parable. You know, the one he gave uh, ten talents, to another he gave five talents. And uh, so we don't all have the same talent and the same opportunities um, as far as uh, the results go. Uh, but we are all, in a sense, we all have the same opportunity that God has given us something and he wants us, he get, he's given us time um, in order to do something for him with that. And so that man is rewarded. And it's interesting that the reward has to do with the kingdom that Jesus sets up when he comes back. You know, the Bible says that we will rule and reign with Christ on the earth. Have you ever thought about that? That you and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not for our sin, but it's for reward. And how you live your life right now will determine what's going to take place in the next life. In the sense when Jesus comes back to the earth and you'll be there, I'll be there, we'll talk about that tonight, in glorified bodies, physical bodies, the bride of Christ, we rule and reign with Christ on this present earth. What will that be? like? Well, if you read Isaiah, you'll see a lot of wonderful things about the kingdom. We'll be talking about that on Sunday nights um, in the next several weeks as we get into chapter 20. Um, but... Um, it's important, it should be important to us now because it will be important to us then. And, you know, people, some believers think, well, as long as I'm saved, I get in by the skin of my teeth and that's all that matters. Well, that might be all that matters now, but when you're there, when we take our crowns and throw them before the feet of Christ, it's going to really matter then. And what's going to take place in this life to come, as Jesus explained to us, will be very, very important. So it's, it behooves us to study that out, to think about those things, and really to live our lives um, for the Lord because we love him, but also because it's going to have a bearing upon our existence in the next life. Now he comes to this third one, verse 20. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a napkin. Now he starts to spiel, he says, for I fear thee because thou art an austere man. You know, I, thought, I don't think God is austere. I think God is very compassionate and very long-suffering, very kind. Um, I think this man is, is reading the, the master wrong here. But then the master, he says, I, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee. He says, if you knew that I was an austere man, and I took up that I laid not down, and I reaped that I did not sow, if that's what you thought about me, then why then did you not give my money to the bank? Because if you put it into the bank, I would have received mine own with interest, with usury, with interest. If you thought I was so hard, why then did you take that which I gave to you? And he says, he wrapped it up in a napkin. He took the pound, and I'm thinking that's the napkin, the hanky. And he took the treasure that God gave to him, that the master gave to him, and he put it into the hanky, and look what he did. He wrapped it up, he closed it up, he didn't do anything with it. He took that treasure, put it in a hanky, and put it in a cupboard somewhere, and forgot all about it. If he hadn't taken it to the bank, the master would have given his money back with interest. It would have been at least invested. At least somebody else would have done something with it. But this man didn't do anything with it. Now, the important principle there, I think, that is, that is very, very important, and really um, it, it scares me in many ways as, I, as a, I look at my own life, is that the man who received the one pound and produced ten pounds out of it, he made a difference with his life. The time that he was here, occupied till I come, it made a difference. His life meant something. His life changed something. The same thing is true with the man with the five pounds. 
Now, it wasn't as much as the 10 pounds, but it still made a difference. And even if this man had taken his hanky and opened it up, opened his hanky up and taken the treasure and went down to the bank and gave to the bank teller the money, it would have still made a difference because the master would have got his money back with interest. But no, he put it into the hanky and he wrapped it up and he sealed it up where it's all nice and safe, where nobody can get at it. And he put it away. But when the master came, he handed back exactly what was given to him. Do you know what that means? It means that his life made no difference. It's like he never, never was there. It's like he never existed. Because his life made no contribution whatsoever. None whatsoever. And my message this morning is that I think that many of us are like this. And the reason this is uh, important to me and to you is because we understand that life is not just an event, it's a process, and we live through our lives. And, you know, Leslie and I, we're in the, you know, the home stretch, as it were. We're 63 years old. And in the olden days, you'd be two years off being an old age pensioner, where I come from. And uh, now they've pushed that on. But, you know, we're still, uh, most of our life is behind us. And I've been preaching for since, you know, well, since I got saved, but full-time in ministry since about 1985. So that's, that's almost next year, be 40 years. And just about every Sunday in the last 40 years I've preached. Very few Sundays I'm not here to preach um, or somewhere. And since we went to Northern Ireland as missionaries, we started the Bray Hill Baptist Church back in 1986. We were on deputation before that. And we were at Bray Hill Baptist Church, and then we started a, a church in Antrim, Northern Ireland, the Berean Baptist Church. And then we went back to Bray Hill. We were preaching there for another three years. And then we started a new church in Glen Gormley Faith Baptist Church. And uh, we were there for six years. And then we came back to the States, and we went to Temple Baptist Church. We preached there for six years. Seems like six years is a big thing for me. But here, been here for 12 years. This is the longest ministry we've ever had at Calvary Baptist Church, and really the joy of my heart. And so it's been constant. But, you know, I'll tell you what. I was walking down the road. I was walking the dog yesterday. And I thought about my life. And, and I thought, you know, there's, there's definitely more opportunities that I could have taken. There's more things that I could have accomplished. And honestly, it scares me that one day I'm going to stand before the Lord. And he's going to say, Tom, what did you do with what I gave you? And if I say, well, Lord, I kept it all nice and safe. I preserved myself. I didn't want to wear myself out. Didn't want to burn out, Lord. So I really looked after myself. Am I going to hand him back a hanky with, with nothing to gain from what he's given to me? God has given me time. He's given me abilities and talents. He's given me treasure. We say that, you know, your time, your talent, and your treasure. But God has given us things of which we are stewards. And one day we have to give them back. And I think one, one of the things that happens in our Christian lives is, and maybe because, maybe when we do venture out and, and uh, we do something for the Lord, and, and then some, sometimes difficult things happen. And maybe we get stung. We get bit, you know, once bitten, twice shy. And we don't really want to, you know, get involved because when you're ministering for the Lord and when you're serving Him, you make yourself vulnerable. In fact, with any investment, there's risk. The man that took the pound out and invested it and got 10 pounds back, you understand when he took that pound out that he was going to have to invest. There's the risk of losing that pound and then you've got to face the master. And yet Jesus is teaching it, I'd rather you risk than to keep it safe. I'd rather you be vulnerable. I'd ra rather that you spend and be spent and even that it would cost you because when you do that, you're going to make a difference with your life. But if you just keep it all nice and safe, wrapped up in a hanky, um, the danger is it makes no difference at all with your life. And we do want to, many times, you know, preserve our own comfort and keep the, our own comfort bubble. And we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be open to hurt. And that's very well. You can do that. But when you do that, and you, you avoid all that risk and all that vulnerability, there's no gain. You won't make a difference. With every investment, there's risk, and so it is in serving the Lord. And so my challenge to us this morning, whatever God has given to you, use it. 
by the time you have, give it to God. Let God use you. Open your hanky. Open your hanky. Don't keep it safe. Risk, invest for eternity for the Lord. Now, that's all very well. Um, but how do we go ahead and do that? Because there's things that would stop us. I'm a human being. I understand a lot of that emotion and those thoughts as well. I want us to go to the book of Ecclesiastes, please. If you go back in the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And we're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter number 11. And I want to ask the question, what stops us from making a difference with our lives? There's a, a number of practical things from the life and teachings of Solomon. Solomon was a, the wisest man that ever lived, besides the Lord Jesus. He wasn't perfect because he messed up. Um, you know, you can, you can know the right things, but doing the right things might be a different thing. But certainly we can learn from what Solomon and the Word of God teaches us here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And then in, these, uh, in this chapter 11, it's, um, the first six verses, I want to notice some of the things that would stop us in our lives from making a difference. And I want to, I want to coin it like this, that we cannot make a difference, first of all, if we keep what we have. If you keep what you have, you'll not make any sort of a difference for time or eternity. And we find that here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. Solomon says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Now that's interesting because, you know, if I have bread, I want it to feed me and my family. And why would I take my bread and throw it on the river, throw it on the waters? And of course, this is an illustration to help us to understand something. That he says, cast your bread upon the waters, and out it will go with the tide. And there it will go, and you'll not see it immediately. But over a period of time, all of a sudden, the tide will come back again, and it will bring bread with it. And uh, the Bible says we reap what we sow. But you can't reap if you don't sow. But also we reap more than we sow. And he says here, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. What the Bible teaches us is, don't keep what you have. In verse 2 he says, Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. But what does that mean? Well, basically what he's saying here is, first of all, we cannot make a difference with our time, our talents, our treasure, if we keep it wrapped up in the hanky. You've got to open the hanky. If you're going to do anything with your life, and the reason I'm telling you is because one of, one of these days, and it might be that your life is taken from you suddenly. It might be that you have a long illness. But at some point in the future, at some point in the future, you're going to be looking back over your life. And certainly at the judgment seat of Christ, he will review your life and he wants to reward you. But if you have not used what God has given to you, what I'm telling you is that's a time of regret. And I've, I've made enough mistakes in my life that I don't like regret. <laughs> I hate regret. I don't want to do those things that I'm going to regret. The, the prudent man foresees the evil and he hides himself. The simple pass on and are punished. I want to be wise enough so that when I end my days or I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I can say, Lord, I use what you gave me. I wish I could say at this point that I've used everything that God has given me and I've taken every opportunity. I know I've already failed, but I don't want to fail anymore. And I want these principles to be important in my life. And we cannot make a difference if we keep what we have. We must be willing to give of ourselves. Investment involves risk. It means sacrifice. It means being vulnerable. But you know, we all give our, our lives for something. You know, you really can't hold on to your life. Your time is going to be spent one way or the other. Are we going to waste it or are we going to invest it? Jim Elliot, the great missionary, said, He is no fool who gives to God what he cannot keep. You know, you can't keep it. It's going to go one way or the other. He is no fool who gives to God that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You realize when you give something to God and the servants of God, whether it's your time, your talents, or your treasure, you give it to God, but God's keeping notes on all of that. And he says you'll get it back tenfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. Look over at John chapter 12 for a moment. Jesus in Matthew 16 verse 25 said, whosoever, For whosoever will save his life, shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall find it. Now that's a paradox. That goes against our human nature. It's against our grain. But there's many things in scripture that are against our human thinking. 
But in my experience in the last 40 something years, that when I obey the Bible, and I just believe what God says, it always works out right. And when I do my thing, it always works out wrong. And of course, Jesus is the great example of this, of giving. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said, and this is the night before he dies, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And so Jesus had to give his life. He realized if he held on to his life, we wouldn't live. He would, he, he would just live himself, but he could bring no one with him. Jesus on the cross died to himself, but through dying to himself, he brought all of us with him to bring many sons to glory. Just like a corn of wheat, you take out or a, an iron wheat or a potato, you take a seed potato, you're not going to eat it. If you're planting that seed potato, it's going to dissolve. You take that seed potato and you put it in the ground, and then it sprouts. And then you get all these other potatoes that come off that seed potato. But you don't get to eat the seed potato. It's gone. But that seed potato produces all these other the potato crop that comes. And so we cannot make a difference if we keep everything in the hanky. If you hold on to your life and you're protecting yourself, I understand that. That's our natural bent. And we're, we don't want to be vulnerable. And yet Paul said, I die daily. Paul was willing to give, to spend and be spent. Because of that, we have half the New Testament written for us and all that God used him to do. John Wesley said, do all the good you can and all the ways you can to all the people you can for as long as you can. And that's exactly what he, what he meant back there in Ecclesiastes when he said, give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what's, what evil shall be upon the earth. It's almost like the, the Christian has been like an investor. What can I do to invest for eternity? Well, I'm going to give. And uh, not just the one or two, I'm going to give the seven. And then maybe another one comes along, there's another opportunity, eight. Well, let's just grab a hold of that as well. Sometimes when missionaries come in here, we do all that we can for missionaries. And maybe we have a missionary comes and we really don't think we can afford to take them on. We take them on anyway. That's why we've got, you know, we have 55 missionaries right now. We did have 56. One of them resigned recently. I'll tell you about that on Wednesday night. But... You know, are we church supporting 55 missionaries? Why do we do that? Because we're looking for investments. And we give, this, we give the six and the seven, and there's another one. Because you're looking for opportunity so that the mindset is not holding it in, not, not guarding it, not, not protecting everything. An investor will not make any money if he does that. No, you've got you to be looking for opportunities. And what, well, what, open the hanky. Let's give the, that one and that one. And, and number eight, yeah, let's do that too. Maybe number nine as well. Because they know it's not what evil shall come up. You might not know what opportunities will close up for you or what time you have left. And so, in order to make a difference, you can't keep what you've got. If we seek to keep what God has given to us, our time, no time for the Lord. Sunday morning, that's it. We got work day? Nope. We do everything in the world. But when it comes to church, it's against my religion to get more involved, right? It shouldn't be that way. Now, our church, I mean, I don't, uh, everything we do is voluntary. And I guarantee you these guys will um, let you know that if I'm asking you to do something, I'm going to be out there too. And I'll be out there probably sometimes by myself. Um, or with a few others. Um, so the time that God has given us, we must, we must give. And the talents, you know, God, you have abilities. Maybe they're not, a, every one of us have at least one spiritual gift. When we're going through the um, people joining the church, you get the Discipleship 101. On the back of that is a, a spiritual gifts test because we want you to know what your spiritual gift is. We want to know what your spiritual gift is because we want you to use that gift in the body of the church. There's talents and abilities and gifts that God has given to you. But if you don't, if you don't use them, then they'll never get used. Wouldn't it be terrible to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord says, you know, I gave you this gift. How did you use it? And you said, I didn't even know I had that gift. Say, so how do you find out what your gift is? Do something. Just start to do anything and everything. And all of a sudden, God will guide and direct you into that thing that, that God puts in desire. You'll love to do it. You'll find great satisfaction in it. And other people will be blessed by it. But you never find that out unless you start doing something. You can't steer a donkey that's not walking. You've got to start walking and, and start doing something and then God will guide and direct you. 
And so we don't hold on to what we've got. You cannot make a difference if you keep what you have. Got that one right? The second thing we see here in Ecclesiastes is this, is that we cannot make a difference if we get discouraged by difficulties. So here we've got our hanky. And we're about to reach in here, but the, oh, no, this doesn't look right. Oh, the timing's all wrong. No, all the, pl- all the pieces are not in place yet. No, it's, it's, it's not right yet. And if you're waiting for the perfect situation where there's no difficulties, you'll never open this up. I read uh, somewhere that, um, I think this might be my next point, but successful people do things before they're ready. That's interesting, isn't it? If you're waiting, and that's probably the next point, but if you're waiting that there, it's a perfect situation and there's no difficulties, you'll, you'll wait forever. Look at this next verse. He says in verse 3, now this is, this is a, philosoph- a philosophical statement. Remember now, Solomon's a very philosophical man. He's a very wise man. But he says this, If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. And you're thinking to yourself, what in the world is that? What does that mean? Here's what it means. There's things that you can't control. If we get some big dark clouds, I hope we do, get some big dark clouds that roll over this property before you get out of here. Do you think we can go out here and say, now you stop that. Don't be raining till we all get in our cars and we're dry on the way home. Can anybody stand out here and command the clouds? Well, the Lord could, but could we go out and, and command the clouds to stop rain when they're full of rain? If the rain's coming, it's coming. You can't control that. Well, if a tree falls, have you ever tried to stop a tree from falling? You better get out of its way. Where we live, we got these big old oak trees, and when they fall, you can hear them a mile away. And when it falls, it's falling. And I'm, you know, it might be a tree that I want, and I'm not going to get out there and start to try to hold this tree up. No, that tree's coming down. And if it wants to come this way, it's going to come that way. If it wants to go that way, toward the north, toward the south, wherever it decides to fall, it's going to fall. And when it does fall, that's where it's going to be. I can't stop it from falling. And I can't even change the direction it's going to fall. I can't stop the clouds from raining. I can't stop the trees from falling or the direction they're going to fall in. There's some things I can't control. And one of the things about life and Christian ministry is that sometimes we think that well, if we're, if we're yielded to the Lord and we want to do God's will and we sell out to God and we open the hanky and we're going to do what God wants us to do, then everything's going to fall, going to fall into place and there'll be no difficulty and be no problems. And then reality hits you. You know, we've, been try- we've planned this, this property and we've planned this building for years and years. You'll read a little bit about it in your bulletin, but um, will there be problems? Of course there'll be problems. Are you kidding me? Everything that man does, there's always difficulties that you feel. What are you going to do? Well, well let's, let's stop everything because there's going to be difficulties. No, we, we find out what the difficulties are. And by God's grace, we try to solve those difficulties or we go around those difficulties. We've got to go on. If, if you allow difficult situations to stop you, then nothing will happen. In church ministry, and I think we've got a wonderful church and I'm grateful for the, the spirit that we have in here. But somewhere along the line, there'll be difficulties. Some, some pastors said, you know, the ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. But people are the ministry. And difficulties, what are you going to do? Are you going to you know, sit down and cry your eyes out? And say, well, I'm not playing anymore. No, there, there'll always be discouragements. There'll always be difficulties. But we can't allow ourselves to be discouraged by the difficulties. The Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth them out of them all. You decide you're going to do something for the Lord. And then difficult things happen. You think, well, I'm not going to do that. No. The devil wants to stop you. Any, any, any time God's doing something, there's an opposition. There's an enemy. Boy, there's an enemy in this world right now. And he's showing his face all over the place. Can we expect? Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation. Can we expect anything less? What are you going to do? You're going to stop, sit down, cry? No, by God's grace, we stand and we continue. And God will help us to go through. It's like we said last, last time that battles will come into our lives. Battles come to everybody. And battles will come when you're right with the Lord. And there's battles will come that you'll not be able to solve. Just like you can't solve these, these uh, you can't stop the rain from, from raining and from the, the trees from falling. There's always going to be problems and difficulties. But you know what? God knew that. 
when he handed them the pound, he says, I knew, I know there's going to be risk. I know there's going to be vulnerabilities and problems, but occupy till I come. Let's see what you can do. And when you need me, call on me and work through the difficulty and look, look, work through the problem. I'm, I'm sharing with you principles because this is not just true in ministry. This is life. It's your life. It's my life. In your house, in your home, in your relationships, in your work, wherever you might be, these are all issues that we all face. We all look at obstacles in our paths, but we can't let them stop us because if they do stop us, then we will make a difference at the end of the day. Don't let the devil stop you. Keep on going. In ministry, you'll be criticized. We talked about that last time, about Mary and her devotion, criticized by Judas and the rest of them. And David's faith and courage, and then Eliab, his older brother, um, you know, I know the naughtiness of your heart. David says, what have I done? Being criticized by the one who should have been encouraging him. And Paul's zeal and sacrifice was maligned and criticized left, right, and center. People will judge your motives. What are you going to do? It happens to everybody. You'll be misunderstood. You'll be spoken against. In fact, the Bible says, Woe unto you, and all men shall speak well of you, for so did they their fathers to the false prophets. God, give me the courage to change the things that I can. Give me the grace to accept the things that I cannot. Give me the grace to accept the things I cannot change. And give me the wisdom to know the difference. And so here's the thing. You don't have to be able to solve every difficulty to make your life count for God. Some of the greatest people in all the world, some of the greatest servants, face great opposition, great difficulties, and failed and failed and failed and failed. Uh, on the way home there, of Sunday night a week ago, I was listening uh, to Erwin Lutzer, and he was telling the story about uh, Colonel Sanders, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he was a failure all of his life until he was 65 years old and he got a stack from the government. He looked at that and he says, I've got to do something different. He says, what can I do? Well, he cooked all his life and he knew how to make chicken. And he went to the bank. He took $87, a $100 check he got from the government and he got a loan and he, he bought some chicken and he bought some cardboard boxes and he fried up some chicken and went door to door in Corbin, Kentucky. I didn't know that, Corbin, Kentucky. And so Kentucky Fried Chicken started when he was 65 years old. But he was a failure all his life. But somehow it didn't stop him. And you may have faced failure and failure and failure. You just want to give up. Don't give up. The best could be yet to come. And so the third thing we see in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 is in verse number 4. We cannot make a difference if we keep what we have. And we cannot make a difference if we get discouraged by difficulties. And we cannot make a difference if we wait for the perfect situation. Now this is kind of akin to verse number 3. But... In verse number four, he says this, He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. In other words, if you are waiting until <laughs> the wind dies down, um, it's too windy, well, it's going to rain, it's going to, we can't sow, it's, it's gonna, the rain's going to come. You're waiting for the perfect situation. You know, unsaved people do that. I remember before I got saved, and I wasn't saved until I was 18 years old. And I was being dealt with by the Lord and other believers for, you know, a couple of months really, about six weeks for sure, before I became a Christian. And um, uh, I was faced with the reality of the truth of the Bible and the reality of my own mortality. I'm going to die. What does the Bible say about it? Well, it's not good. The Bible says you're going to go to hell because you're a sinner. Didn't want to look at that, but that's, that was the truth. And it kept coming back to me. And I thought, you know, even if that's a possibility, that's, that's very serious, you know. And I thought, well, you know, I'm only 17 years old, I have a long way to go. And then um, a gearbox dropped, dropped on me. I was a diesel mechanic, and a gearbox dropped on me. I fell off a jack, and my hand was underneath it. I still have the scar. It started right there. You, I don't know if you can still see the scar right there. Um, and it ripped my hand open to there. And uh, one of the guys said to me, well, what would happen if that was your head instead of your hand? There was a guy in our guy who was driving the forklift and the, these, you know, the, the bays where the mechanics go down underground and he drove that, he was reversing that forklift and he, 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 he dumped it into one of those pits and he fell off it, got pinned between the forklift and the, the edge of that and he died. Simple. Happens all the time. 
But I thought, well, one of these days I'm going to get saved. I've got to get saved. I know I don't want to die the way I am. But later on, I'll get saved. Later on. When the time is right, I'll get saved. But you know the time is never right. You and I know this as believers. That maybe that happened in your life. There is no right time to get saved. As far as it's all be perfect. And all you know, the stars will line up. And I'll get all the right feelings. And the emotion will be there. And I'll just know it's at the right time. It never happened. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. It says now is the accepted time. It doesn't even say today is the day of salvation. It says now. Because the rest of the day is not guaranteed. Right now, the present is all we have. And then we understand the lost people say, well, when the, when the time is right, when the feeling is right, when the atmosphere is right, then I know it's the right time. And they'll die like that. There's people in hell right now that thought they would get that moment. And so we understand, but believers do that too, Christians too, or uh, we adopt the same view that one of these days I'm going to do what God wants me to do. One of these days I know what God has given me. One of these days I really intend to open up the hanky. I'm going to take what God gave me. I'm going to start using it. One of these days I'm going to open the hanky. But the time's not right just yet. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Nothing will happen. Now, the problem is, at the end of your day, you're going to look back and say, look at all the time, and all the talent, and all the abilities that God gave me, all the opportunities, and I made no difference. Now what? It's accountability. We've got, to look, we've, got to, we've got to face the Lord with that. Look over to Proverbs 22 for just a moment. The Bible speaks of these. These are human um, thoughts that, that they're not right. God corrects us by his word. In chapter 22 of Proverbs, verse 13, it says, The slothful man... Say, if there is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. <laughs> the point is, he's just lazy. He's always making an excuse. Oh, it's too, too dangerous out there. Oh, I can never do that. Too difficult. Too, too dangerous. I'll be slain in the streets. It'll all be lost. All end in tears. Well, how do you know if unless you try? Anybody that, one of the great things about America is you can tie effort with reward. That's why communism is a bad thing. That's why socialism is a bad thing. Because you get reward no matter what your effort is. You break into the country. And they give you a place to stay. And they give you money to spend. And they give you whatever you need. Your health care. My health my care not free. Is your health care free? And these people. And they wonder they want to come into their country. That it's, it's, it's for nothing. Right? But see that's not right. And that's not America. America is you work. You work hard. You get the reward for it. And the government's not supposed to penalize you. If you work really, really hard, then you should be really, really rewarded. And that link should always be there. But you see, this kind of thing, uh, no, I, I, I'm not going to get involved because it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. I'll be slain in the streets, waiting for the perfect situation. Now is the perfect situation. There is no perfect situation, so now is the time. Whatever it is, God will have us to do. Look back at page Proverbs 20 and verse number 4. The sluggard will not plough by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest. Now watch. And have nothing. And ha have nothing. You know, maybe you come into the, ch the church this morning and maybe these are not anywhere close to your thoughts. And the reason the Bible reminds us of these things is because one of these days we will have to give an account. And I mean, I, I think you're probably like me. I don't want to stand before the Lord and see waste. A wasted life. There was a wee man by the name of Freddie Burgess. He lived and lived his whole life in, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He was about that height. No kidding. We Freddie, we called him. And uh, when I met him, he was about 73 years old. And we used to pick him. We used to drive the bus. When I, <laughs> when I was a pastor in Belfast, we would leave early, like an hour, an hour and a half early, drive to Belfast, and then we'd do a, a, an hour bus route. Me, the pastor, I'd pick everybody up in the bus, bring them to the church, and then I would I would do that. I would lead the singing. Um, we would take, you know, the ushers would get the offer, and we'd have to take it home and count it. And then after the service, would would put everybody back on the bus another hour, dropping people off, and then half an hour home. So it was it was pretty hard work, you know. Um, but anyway, we used to pick we Freddie up on the bus, and he was a wee man. He was a great talker. He was a great prayer. And when you ever hear Freddie praying, it was unbelievable. You thought you were in heaven. And he was the one that would say, Lord, he used to say, this was a little phrase, he said, Lord, close us in with thy presence. Do you know what that means? I don't know if you, you should know what that means, you know. 
There's a time in, in church meetings where you just sense the Lord all around you. You're closed in with the presence of God. Well, anyway, Freddie, when he was just a young fellow, he was, a, he was a teenager, he went to Pentecostal church. And he, he got saved and he, he felt like the Lord would have him to preach. And he heard about the Bible school in England. And uh, other young people were excited about going. He was wanting to go. He came forward in the service. He says, I'm going to go to Bible school in England. And so all the arrangements were made for him to go to the Bible school. But the problem was, he didn't have the money. And a week before Freddie was to go to Bible school, he told the pastor, I can't go. Why can't you go? I don't have the money. And he pulled out. And what Freddie didn't know was there was a wee woman in that church. She says to the pastor, if Freddie goes, she says, I will take care of his bill completely but he has to be willing to go and for some whatever reason it didn't happen and freddie got discouraged to get out of church and when we when pastor Bissett picked him up on the bus the pastor uh, of the church that was there before me he had been backslidden out of the will of god for like 50 years he married an unsaved woman his life was just ruined and wrecked and wasted his, he was now a widow, widower, and uh, Pastor Bissett met him, started bringing him to church, and he got right with the Lord. And uh, Pastor Bissett had him preach, we had him preach a few times. Lovely man. But he told us in his message, he says, you know, I wasted my whole life. And he, he's the one who told us that story. He says, I wasted my whole life because, he says, I was waiting for the perfect situation. And I didn't step out by faith. Just step out anyway. And the last thing we want to notice quickly is in verse 5 and 6. If we go back, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. So we cannot make a difference if we keep what we have. And we can't make a difference if we get discouraged by difficulties. And we cannot make a difference if we're waiting for the perfect situation. And we cannot make a difference, finally if we wait for all the answers. Now, I want you to know a still phrase, thou knowest not. Now, he said that before, over in verse number two, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. And then in verse five, he says, as thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit. Do you know everything that God is doing? Now, there's many things that God has revealed in his word. That's what we're to believe. But in day-to-day -day life and in other people's lives, and even in your life, do you know all that God is doing? Do you know everything about you? Do you know who your great, 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 great grandfather was? Where he lived? What he did for a living? Who his friends were? Do, do you know any of that? No. God knows everything about you. Do you know how many hers is in your head? God knows. There's many, many things that we don't know. And he says, Thou knowest not the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Do we know how... Um, and by the way, that's actually true that bones actually grow in the womb. Do we know how that happens? No, not really. And then he says, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. We don't know everything that God is doing. We don't know what God is going to do with you or with me or even with our church. In verse 6 it says, in the morning sow thy seed and in the evening withhold not thine hand. There's the given again. You say, well, I'm not going to give until God shows me exactly what's going to happen with it. You know, I, we are, listen, I, we give uh, out of worship our tithes. We give, we give our tithes to the church here. We give uh, building offerings. We give the missions. Uh, do I know, I probably would know more than anybody, how the money's been used. Um, but... Uh, but I really don't know how that's going to be used. When we give it to me, we don't know how it's really going to be used. Do you know how your money's going to be used? We don't have the answers to those questions. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. He says, so in the morning, so in the evening. You know, uh, when Tom Wallace was here, um, we celebrated his 94th birthday. Uh, and he made this statement a few years ago. He was praying that the Lord would, would give him 100 years. He wants to live till he's 100. And his prayer was, Lord, and I think he prayed this when he was 90. And he says, Lord, I want you to use the last 10 years of my life more than the first 90. Now, how would that be possible? Well, he's, I mean, he's a tremendous man for his age, no doubt about it. But the, I don't know if you know much about Tom Wallace, but the Lord greatly used him in his youth. I mean, he pastored churches of thousands and thousands of people. 
and speaks regularly. So how is the Lord going to use him more in the last 10 years than he did in the first 90? Well, he said this. He said, you know, maybe through my witnessing, and he witnesses a lot. He goes to the furs and witnesses. sees lots of people see it. He says, I'm praying that the Lord will give me maybe one man who's going to be like the next D.L. Moody. If I just get one of those guys saved, and then they just go out and win the world of the Lord, then the Lord will have used me in the last 10 years more than the first 90. You see, we cannot make a difference if we wait for all the answers. God doesn't tell us our life story, what he's going to do with us. Now, he certainly has a plan. God has a will. God has a map for us. But he says to us, follow me. He says, follow me. You know what that means? We follow him one step at a time. God doesn't sit down and say, Tom, now here's what I'm going to do with your life. When I got saved and I was in Bible school four months after I was saved, two months after I was, I was saved, I gave my life to the Lord. And at that point, the Lord didn't sit down and say, now, Tom, here's what's going to happen in the next 40 or 50 years. He didn't, he didn't let me in on that, all of that. You see, the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path, but a lamp is not something that's going to beam down the road 40 miles. You're not going to see what's down there. The only thing you're going to see is right at your feet. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, so I can take the next step. I can take the next step. But I don't know what's down the road. I don't know that. I don't know what God has for me. You don't know what God has for this church. And uh, you might be enjoying, I'm enjoying the church. I think it's wonderful. I hope the church will grow. But even if the church doesn't grow, and if I outlive my days here, and maybe we get this building built, and then some young fellow come in here and just set the world on fire, and they'll fill that building up, and they'll have to go up to the property. I've got nine acres up there, and they'll build another, like, 2,000 seed on a turn. I don't know. You don't know. Because we don't know, does that mean that we just don't do anything? No, he says, thou knowest not. But he says, sow. In the morning, sow thy seed. In the evening, sow. So people serve the Lord in their youth. And then they get to my age and they think, well, I've done all I can do. And you, you do get tired and your body gets sore. And uh, you think you're dying. And maybe you are dying. But um, you just think, well, I just can't do what I used to be able to do. And you, you just kind of, then you start coasting. Maybe we should be like Tom Wallace. Lord, use the last part of my life. Sow in the evening. You sowed in the morning. Good. Sow in the evening. Keep sowing because you don't know what God's going to do with you. But if we wait for all the answers, say, now, Lord, you've got to show me everything you're going to do or I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to open the hanky unless you tell me exactly, you know, how, how many pounds I'm going to get through this investment and the vulnerability and the risk and the hurt that I've got into. You've got to, you got to show me what's going to happen. God doesn't operate like that. He says, you occupy till I come. You do what you can with what I've given you. Be faithful. Do all that I can. And leave the results with God. Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Because you know what? It's the Lord. It's the Lord's work. Your life belongs to God. And he will use you. But he can't use you till you get your hanky out. And open the hanky and say, Lord, whatever I am, whatever I have is yours. And God, help me. I know my limitations, but Lord, please help me to make a difference with my life. Because one of these days, as surely as I'm standing here, I will be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. To give an account of my life. The stewardship, when God gives you something, there's a stewardship. which means accountability that we have to, as he, as he told us here in the Gospel of Luke. And as Jeremy preached on Wednesday, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What does that mean? It means one day we're going to be happy. One day we'll be rejoicing that the sacrifice that we made and the investments we made, successful or not successful, but at least we, we did our best and we gave and we gave. We gave the six and the seven and the eight. We kept on taking every opportunity of investing in the Lord's work for eternity. And then, then we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What does that mean to be faithful? It means to be faithful with what God has given you. Your time, your talents, your treasure, invested for the Lord. And so, you don't have to know all the answers to make a difference. I don't know all the answers. You don't either. But you don't have to know all the answers to make a difference. And you don't have to have the perfect situation to make a difference. And you don't have to be able to solve every problem to make a difference. But one thing you do have to do, you got to open the hanky. You can't hold on to it. 
if you hold on to it, it's like you never lived. God has given all of us the most wonderful opportunity to live for him, to occupy till he comes. May you and I be helped of God to do just that. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your precious word, how it challenges and encourages us. And Lord, I needed to preach this to me today because we all of us face problems and difficulties. But Lord, help us not to be discouraged to the point where we stop. May we be revived and encouraged. And Lord, maybe just something was said today to help somebody say, you know what? I'm, I'm keeping stuff in the hanky and I've got I've to gotta get out there and use what I've got to the glory of God. Lord, would you help us? We are needy people. We don't have all the answers. Sometimes we don't have any of the answers. But Lord, we know you and you have everything that we need. So Lord, help us in our hearts this morning as we finish to respond to you in our hearts. Would you help us, Lord? We need you. And there's people in this room today who have problems and issues and there's discouragement and they don't know what to do. But Lord, help them to put their eyes upon you. And then would you come to them and say, fear not or be dismayed for the battle is not yours but God's. And Lord, you will lead us and you will help us to make a difference with our lives. So help us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take our song weeks, please, and turn to number 532 as we close. 532. Now this is a, it's not an invitation song. I rarely actually use invitation songs, but it's a song that goes with this message. Must I go and empty handed, thus my dear Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him, lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go and empty handed? Let's all stand together as we sing. Must I go and empty handed thus my dear Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him, lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go and empty handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him must I empty handed go. Now let's pray for just a wee moment. We won't sing all these verses, I'm sure. But do you get the message of this song? I'm going to, I'm going to have to stand before the Lord. I mean, that, that scares me in some ways. Have I really been faithful? Have I been used? Did my life make a difference? Is there not one day of service that we can lay at his feet? No trophy, no soul that we can bring with us. Not at death I shrink to falter, for my Savior saves me now. But to meet him empty-handed, thought of that now clouds my brow. Maybe, maybe this doesn't concern you, but it concerns me. I think all of us should be concerned. May God help us. Let's sing verse number three. Oh, the years of sinning wasted, could I but recall them now? I would give them to my Savior, to his will I gladly bow. Must I go and empty handed? Thus I meet my Savior so. Not one soul with which to greet him must I empty handed go. And can I just say this before we sing verse 4 that if you're listening this morning and you're not saved, you know, we have to stand before the, before the Lord to account for what, what God has entrusted to us, our stewardship. And that's not for sin, it's not for punishment, it's all for reward or lack of reward. But friend, if you're going to stand before Christ without him as your saviour, then he stands as your judge and you have the answer for your sin. There's a day of reckoning coming. And friend, you need a saviour. And if you're not saved, he loves you. He is there for you. He's available. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out.
But you got it's your choice. You gotta come. You gotta believe. You gotta trust him. I would encourage you to do that. Because that day is coming. And it's coming fast. Let's sing verse four as we close. Oh ye saints, arise, be earnest, up and work while yet tis day. Ere the night of death o'ertake thee, strive for souls while still you may. Must I go and empty handed? Must I meet my Saviour so? Not one soul with which to greet him must I empty handed go. Amen. Did the message speak to you today? When we come to church and we open the Bible, we're, we're pointed to it toward, you know, eternity, eternal things. What's going to happen later? And God wants us to be busy now. So what I'm saying to you, open your hanky. All right? And let God use you. Let's pray together. And uh, Brother Joel, Martin, if you close our meeting, please, this morning.